Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Let's read these verses together. And this is dense. You guys, this is so dense. So after I'm done reading it, I'm going to call on one of you to explain it in five minutes, and then we'll call it good and we'll worship some. Okay. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now and we thank you that you are the giver of every good gift. And we thank you that the gifts that you give are wrapped up in the central gift of your son. And we thank you that we experience these spiritual blessings of which there are many as we abide in Christ. We thank you that these blessings are of a spiritual nature, which means that regardless of our circumstances in this world, we have the ability to experience intimacy with you by the power of your spirit. We thank you that you chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, which tells us that your decision, Lord, about us is discovered in Christ. For you made a decision to identify yourself with a broken humanity before the foundation of the world. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are with us and at the center of all that we think and do. We thank you that because of you, and, and when we are in you, that we become co-heirs with you, and that we become a royalty, and we become your bride, and we become the church, which now partakes of the gift of yourself, that we might enter into the battle that is all around us in the heavenly places. Lord, may we be a people that declare and live out the victory that is already yours, for you are putting all things under yourself, for you are the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And so we worship you, our King, our King Jesus. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Wow. Let's pray. <laughs> This passage is probably one of the densest passages found in the New Testament. You know, this is, this is composed of a single sentence. Paul, no punctuation, if you were to read it in the Greek. It's literally the long, it's, it's a horrible run-on sentence that declares the multitude of God's blessings toward us in Christ through the Spirit. And it's a powerful declaration of the way that God blesses us because we live in a day where there is much confusion about the blessings of God. We live in a day when people do not understand what it means to receive a gift from God because when we think of God's blessings, what we naturally look toward is, is toward that material blessing that so many proclaim in churches across the world the promise of health, the promise of wealth, the promise of that perfect boyfriend or girlfriend, husband or wife, the promise of 
healthy children. We're looking to the external, toward the physical, toward the material to experience what God intends to give us in Jesus, in the spiritual, in the inner man, in the inner woman, which enables us to deal with the difficulties of a world that doesn't give us what we want. And so what I want us to see tonight and what I want us to consider is how does God bless us? And what does this blessing look like? Because when we think about the blessing that we see, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, the blessing toward the children of Israel for obedience was indeed material blessing. The promise of the land, the promise of cattle, the promise, the promise of provision. But when we compare that to the blessings that we discover in the New Testament under the new covenant as a new humanity under the God-man, Jesus, we discover that the blessing goes inward, internally, and it is much, much deeper and much better than anything that we can receive from this fallen world. For it is the promise of the gift of Christ himself. And there actually is a parallel to that in the Old Testament. For you remember the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, were told that they will have no inheritance in the land because the Lord himself would be their portion. And we are told in the New Testament that under Christ, we are, we are a royal what? Priesthood. And therefore, the blessing that is the gift that we receive from the good giver, which is our Father, is the gift of his Son by the work of his Spirit. And so right off the bat, I want to just blow out of your mind this idea that God is here to give you everything you ever wanted because you don't know what you want until you've tasted Jesus. And then you'll see that all that really matters is the spiritual gift that enables us to live in the material world with victory. And so here, here's the thing. The first thing that I, I want you to see is that the blessing, the blessing that comes from God, it says, and, and notice Paul begins with just a statement of worship. It like snowballs into this, this unraveling of this blessing. And the blessing of God is this. Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In other words, the blessing that God brings to us is the incarnation which is the God-man, Jesus Christ, or Jesus, our King, or King Jesus. And the blessing is this, is that God in Jesus has chosen to identify himself with broken humanity now and forever. That's the blessing. That a rebellious world, a rebellious people have become the very focal point of God's absolute perfect affections. And it's revealed in one word, Jesus. Because God has chosen to move into our lives through Christ that he might have for himself a people. And that was the intent of making the creation. He made the creation through Jesus. He redeemed the creation through Jesus. I should say he made the creation through the Son and he redeemed the creation through Jesus, the God-man, the Son of God become flesh. And so I want us to understand this because right off the bat, you see that God's blessing toward us is God's identification with us in Christ, but it also is an incredible picture of the Trinity because here we see the Father is the giver of the gift, we see the sun is the reservoir. All the gift is wrapped up in Christ. And that we see the spirit is the communicator. Because what does it say about the type of gift it is? It says a spiritual blessing, which speaks of the quality of the gift as well as the means by which the gift is given. And so the quality of the gift is something that transforms us spiritually on the inside. We who were once carnal are now a spiritual people because we have been transformed through our faith in Christ and what he has done for us, the Holy Spirit comes in and transforms our lives, communicating to us the truth of who Jesus is, 
And the truth of who Jesus is is a reflection of what the Father is like and therefore a knowledge of God that is an intimate relational knowledge becomes available to us through this powerful gift that comes from the triune God. So in the very first verse, verse three, we see the Trinity unveiled. That God, a community unto himself, truly has one name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Father is the giver of good gifts. And the Son is the reservoir in which that gift is, is held together. And the Spirit is the communicator of that gift to our hearts. And that's why Paul ends his letter in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 when he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Trinity, it, it, it permeates this entire passage. And so what I want us to see tonight is, is what does this spiritual blessing look like? What are the what are the manifestations of this spiritual blessing? And what's fascinating, this has been a passage that I've been meditating on since the beginning of the new year. I just finished this incredible book by a great Scottish theologian named Thomas Torrance called The Incarnation, which has is, which is fed my soul in ways that I can't even begin to describe to you and has given me a vocabulary for things that, that I've, I have often found complex and difficult to explain as a pastor, and I'm hoping after tonight that the proof that this book has been healthy for me will be in the fact that you understand anything that I say because I'm understanding what I'm saying, and if, I'm, if I don't, if at any point I become confused, I'm going to call on someone randomly to explain what I was saying. It's because we're one body, one family. You guys all have a role to play. You, in the blue shirt, stand up. Election, go. Two minutes. <laughs> Can you imagine? Ben, just stand up, election. It'll be great. Give it a whirl. Um, so, so the spiritual gift is the Holy Spirit's work in us as a communicator of Jesus, who the gift is him. But notice where the gift is. What does it say? It, it, to, to really knock it out of the material realm, he says that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the what? Heavenly realms or heavenly places, but really in the Greek, it's the heavenlies. And it's the only place in the New Testament that this phrase is used. And it's used five times, this, this word. And it, it begins here, it says that the Father blesses us with every spiritual blessing. So there, there are spiritual gifts and the gift is the gift of Christ in you, the hope of glory. And it's, it's a gift that's given to us in the heavenly realm. What is meant by that? And I would argue that it's not so much geography as it is dimension or realm, I think is probably the best translation. Look at, at, at uh, verse 20 of chapter one. He exerted when he raised Christ from the, from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realm. So Christ's resurrection physical resurrection uh, and ascension to the right hand of the Father in the heavenly realms. And yet it's strange because Christ is forever human who is the hope of our resurrection body. And I just always trip out that somewhere, somewhere physical Jesus is right now. And I don't know what that means. And I, I just believe it. I don't know what it means. But look what it says now in, in Ephesians chapter two, verse six, it says, and God raised us up with Christ. That's speaking in the present tense. We've been raised with Christ. We were buried with him in his death and we were raised with him in his life. And it says, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So where Christ is, I would say that Christ is with us. He says, I will dwell within you, which means that there's a piece of us that's with him in that realm, already enjoying the perfections of, what does that mean? Once again, I believe it, I don't fully understand it. Now look at, at Ephesians chapter three, verse 10. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Who are those guys? And then flip forward, to Ephesians chapter six, verse 12, the final time that this phrase is used. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil 
in the heavenly realms. So clearly, Paul is declaring a, a, a reality to us that most of us live without an awareness of, but it's the place where the gifts of God is obtained, but it's also a place where the child of God and the church of God engages in spiritual warfare. This is fascinating to me because so many of us live our Christian lives um, in the most basic, primal refusal to get up out of our sin. And if heaven means anything, it means up. And the thing is, is that Christ contains within him the gift of the heavenly realm. And he comes down to us and he gets under our sin, but he demands that we rise up. And we rise up and we live and we walk by the spirit, not by the flesh. And when we rise up and we keep our eyes fixed on Christ, what we're told here, especially in, in Ephesians chapter three, so we're told that this is what happened to Jesus, is that he was resurrected from the dead and that he ascended to the right hand of the Father, was seated by him. But then it says that we were seated with him, that the victory of Christ is a spiritual victory that is already ours, but we're not necessarily experiencing it because we're living too much in the world and not in the spiritual realities of what God has done for us in Christ. But then it says in Ephesians 3 that the church is the, is the emblem of Christ's victory to the powers and domains that are found in the spiritual realms. And then finally, in Ephesians chapter 6, we are told that the heavenly realms is, is a realm in which spiritual forces are at play. In other words, we have found ourselves in the middle of a serious battle. And the only way to get the gift is to enter into the place where the battle's taking place. So now I ask you, does the gift of God sound awesome to you? Because as you receive the gift, and the gift is Christ himself, and the gift, it's all spiritual gifts, all spiritual blessings increases as we surrender to him and our knowledge, our intimate personal knowledge of him increases. But as we grow in Christ and we trust in his victory, what the gift does is it prepares us for warfare. And I think that the parallel of this is found in, in the Old Testament when the children of Israel are taken out of slavery from Egypt, and the goal is they are to go out of Egypt that they might go into what? The promised land. Someone's like, the wilderness. No, that was not the goal. The goal was the promised land. And the promised land was the place where what happened? The most battles. There were hardly any battles in the wilderness. The wilderness is where the Israelites acted like stupid human beings act, which is they doubted God, they doubted their salvation, they kept longing for the life that they had in Egypt, even though it was a life of slavery, and so they found themselves wandering in wilderness living, and I think much of the church today does a lot of wilderness living because we're not engaged in the battle. We're like, I haven't, I'm, the victory of Jesus is so great in my life, I've never tasted spiritual warfare. You aren't tasting the gift of Jesus because to taste the gift of Jesus is to engage in the war. And I want you guys to understand that because I think we should always count the cost. The cost of receiving the greatest gift you've ever had in your life means that you will also become a vessel by which Christ uses you to battle the very gates of hell, to storm the gates of hell. For the ruler of this world, he says, has nothing in me. He has nothing in me. But he also says that in this world, you will be hated. You will be hated and you will be persecuted for my name's sake. And he also tells us that it's a gift to engage in the sufferings of Christ. For to taste the battle for Jesus is a worthy cause worth lying your life down, I would say. Okay, there you have it. There's a little spiritual patriotism for you. All right, so, so I, I want us now to look at, at how this gift unfolds before us in this passage in Ephesians, it's really powerful. And so the first thing that we see is that the gift plays itself out in election. God's decision about us, verses four through five. He says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. 
In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. First of all, I would just state this very simply. If I was to reword this passage, I would just borrow from a book I just read called The Mirror Bible, which is a, which is a re, it's like a one man's, uh, one man's interpretation, kind of like the message of the scripture. But he had a great, uh, a great statement, a way of saying uh, this passage. He says, in Christ, he says this, all it states is that before God lost us in Adam, he possessed us in Christ. Before God lost us in Adam, he possessed us in Christ. I like that. It goes very much hand in hand with Tozer's great statement, one of those confusing but profound sentences in the pursuit of God where he says, God is always previous. God is always previous. But what I like about this idea of election is is that it's this. It's God's intervention, his willingness, his determined willingness to enter in to time in Christ, to choose us. It's powerful. You see, the problem with election is that we often think of it in terms, and this is a doctrine that has created more division in the church than any other doctrine. It's, it's separated entire movements because people have come to conclusions about election and predestination that are very troubling and upsetting. But let me just tell you what I do not believe election is. I do not believe that election is a divine determinism. In other words, what I mean by that, I do not believe that it is a static decision made back there somewhere in time in the secret decrees of God and behind time. Because any time you find election in the scripture, in the New Testament, excuse me, in the New Testament, you will find that it is directly connected to the incarnation. We cannot separate election from the God-man. We cannot. And even more so than that, whenever we see God's choosing throughout Scripture, it is never about God choosing you but rejecting him. It's not about God's, this this weird mean streak in God where back before the foundation of the world in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit got together and they're like, what about so-and-so we're going to make? That just seems weird, doesn't it? Let's make him, but then let's send him to hell. Is that your idea of God? And then we'll say, well, what about Romans 9? Who are you? Who are you to speak against the wisdom of God? If God chooses to make some vessels for destruction and other vessels for glory, who are we, O man, to speak against the wisdom of God? But what do we see in the election of God? Is there a wisdom? Is there a logic to election? And I would argue that there is. Because if we bring it to a static decision made back there somewhere in history. What we are forced to adhere to is one of the most, in my opinion, damaging doctrines that's held to by some in the church today, which is the doctrine of double predestination, which is the belief that God literally creates some for heaven and he creates others for hell. That he might display his glory and wrath in some and then he might display his glory and grace in others. And it's not for us to question why he would only choose some. It's, 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 it's the real question is, why would he choose any? That's how I always hear that explained. That's not helpful. And why is it only the elect who are ever convinced that they're chosen? Nobody, nobody ever says, I'm a reprobate. <laughs> nobody ever says that. <laughs> we always stick ourselves on the elect side. And if you don't, you go crazy like Cowper and kill yourself because you're tormented by the question of whether or not you were ever picked. Because if it truly is a decision made by God that is completely separate from anything that God foresees or knows to be true about you, then there really is nothing you can do. Nothing you can do if God did not choose you, if indeed that is how election works. But let's, let's step back because that's not how I believe election works. And that's not what I believe the scripture says. Let's look at the logic of election. Let's begin in the Old Testament. The first place that we see a real uh, direct choosing, I would say you can go all the way back to Noah. God chooses Noah to be an an object of his redemptive plan for a broken humanity. Um, But the real place where you first see call, selection, election, choosing, is you see it in Abraham. Genesis chapter 12 has the call of Abraham. God calls a pagan man named Abraham, Abraham, 
We don't have any evidence that he was following after the true God, but God calls him, reveals himself to him, and says, it says, I have chosen you. I've, I've, I've picked you. And through your seed, and Abraham was already an old man, he said, through your seed, all nations will be blessed. He says, Genesis 12, 3, all people on earth will be blessed through you. I have chosen you, one person, that through your family, all people would be blessed. There you have the illogical election the first time. Okay, then you have, you move forward from Abraham, you move to a people group, the children of Israel. God chooses an insignificant, rebellious group of people who are slaves in Egypt, and, and he, he takes this group and he leads them out of slavery and he brings them reluctantly into the promised land and there they fail in the promised land. But one of the passages that we are given in Exodus chapter 19, verse six, is that through Moses, God says to the children of Israel, I have chosen you, not because of anything awesome about you. In fact, you were small, you were insignificant as a nation, but I have chosen you that you might be a nation of priests and a blessing to all people. What is the role of the priest? The priest is a mediator between God and man. God says of Israel, you aren't to be a nation with priests because that's what they became. You are to be a nation of priests. In other words, you are to be me the mediators of my goodness, my redemptive plan, and my longing to have reconciliation with a broken humanity, which is the exact thing that you just spent weeks looking at with the story of Jonah. God chooses an individual to bring redemption to a rebellious group of people. And then you move forward from there because the choosing of Israel goes to the choosing of the disciples by Jesus. What does Jesus say? Which really speaks to the choosing of us. In John chapter 15, verses 16 and 17, it's a very troubling verse if it's just about God back there choosing you or not choosing you. But when Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. So what does Jesus do? He says, hey, to the, the, the 12, I, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And even says, many are called, few are chosen. Whoa, what the, what's going on right now? But then you move to the end of Matthew 28, and the Great Commission to those whom he chose. I chose you and appointed you that you would bear fruit, that you would bear fruit. And so now election, if we look at the logic of election, we see that it's not simply God randomly selecting some individuals back in eternity past, but we see that it is God choosing individuals and nations as the means of being vessels and carriers of his redemptive plan to all. In fact, in Matthew 28, go therefore into all nations to that 12 that he chose. So election carries with it three realities. First of all, that it, it begins and ends with, it's God's work from start to finish. Can't get around that. Secondly, that it carries with it a daunting responsibility that you have been chosen to be a carrier of God's good news to all. And third, it is the privilege because you have become co-heirs with Christ. But I wanna bring one final element to this that I think will bring the most clarity to it because that still doesn't answer the question if God's, God's decision about you has nothing to do with anything that you have done. There's got to be something deeper than that, and I would say that election supremely is tied up in Christ, in the God-man. And I would say that election is, by definition, Jesus. The Word became flesh, true God and true man, for in Jesus we have both the choosing God and the chosen man. For he is the firstborn over all, over a new humanity, the firstborn over all creation. Christ is the chosen man as well as the choosing God. That's significant, isn't it? Think about it. The tension. He was, it's one of the things the church has held on to since its origin, that in Jesus we have, we have the God-man, both truly God and truly man. Both sides 
in Jesus, we have the judging God and the judged man. In Jesus, we have both the electing God and the elect one. In Jesus, we have God and man. And he is our representation, he is our representative man. He stands in the gap for us. God chose Christ before the foundation of the world. Therefore, all who are in him are chosen. And who has he chose through Christ? Well, the choosing of Christ is God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So election then is the eternal decision of God's eternal love toward humanity moving into time and confronting us in Jesus. It is a dynamic act, an eternal decision that is ever present and confronts humanity with the decision that God has made about them. You know that song, I have decided to follow Jesus. We should change that. God has decided to accept me. I don't know. <laughs> in Jesus. But see, the thing is, is, okay, so the question is like, well, Josh, are you saying then that everyone is chosen because God's decision about all of humanity is wrapped up in his, his choosing Christ? And that is something I want to explain a little further, but all I would say is this, is that the scripture is absolutely clear that there are those who reject the decision that God has made about them in Jesus. And so, yes, I believe that God's election of Christ is, has a universal application, but it will not be universally responded to because we have seen many people who have been confronted with the decision that Christ has, has, that God has made for them in Christ, and yet they have rejected that decision. And in doing so, they have put themselves outside of Christ and remain objects of his judgment because they rejected the judgment bearer in Jesus. And so the election is wrapped up in Jesus. And it helps tremendously when we think that election carries with it that great responsibility because Jesus showed us that his election meant the responsibility of carrying the judgment of the world. So there we have the picture of election. Isn't that a wonderful gift? God has chosen you in Jesus. And if you've responded to that decision, so what happens is that God's decision about you, you are confronted with that decision in Jesus. And as the Holy Spirit opens up your eyes to the reality of what Christ has done for you, what he says is all who believe shall be saved. He unveils the truth and you decide to respond to that decision that's already been made. So it's all God's work from beginning to end. Powerful, powerful. Okay, if that makes your head spin, good. Welcome to the club. Uh, look at the second section. God, this is the second aspect of God's gift. It's his grace, God's love toward us. It's not just his election, God's decision for us, it's also his grace, God's love toward us in verses six through eight. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us, in the one he loves, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. And so here's the thing with grace. When we look at this, that God has poured out his glorious grace on us in Christ and that this grace uh, contains within it redemption, which is, which is uh, Christ has taken our place. He's, he is our ransom. Uh, he's brought freedom uh, to our lives and in forgiveness of our sins. But this grace is lavishly poured out on us. Grace in its truest essence is simply self-giving love in its purest form. And when you think about the way that you love and I love, our love is, genu uh, is generally connected uh, to uh, what we discern in another to be lovable characteristics. Our love toward people is generally connected to what we find lovable about them. But the difference in God's love is that God's love, because he's an electing God, his love is an elective love. And all I mean by that is, is that, that he 
chooses to love sinners in their sin. That his love is self-generated. That it's based out of who he is, not out of what you are. If you think that there is something in you worth loving, you are mistaken. For it says that we are wicked and deceitful above all things and not to be trusted. That's what it says of the human heart. You all have human hearts. If we're dealing with the spiritual realities, I don't care how good you've been externally in comparison to the perfections of God, you suck, okay? You're like, no, I don't, I'm awesome. No, you're not. But God says, I love you. I love you in all of your brokenness. And the grace that he is, and not only do I love you, I don't just tell you that I love you. I don't just make declarations about that love, but that love is wrapped up in my willingness to give my son who will carry upon himself all your suckiness so that you can be free. It's a free gift that comes out of the heart of who God is, and it is a gift that sets us free because it brings about redemption, reconciliation, and revelation of who God is and who we can be in Christ because of what Christ did for us. That's why the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, because those who are perishing refuse to accept that they can't earn God's salvation. Even the atheist or the agnostic said, I don't need to be saved, is essentially what they're saying. I don't need a God. I am my own God. He says, the fool says in his heart that there is no God, and sin is the evidence that we are fools. And so here we have this great reality of God's grace toward us. It says that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. He didn't die for us because we accepted him. He died for us while we were absolutely rebelling against him, while we didn't want anything to do with him because Jesus himself reveals the heart of the Father when he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. So the, the triune God reveals that it is a heart of forgiveness that it has toward us. And that forgiveness is costly. The forgiveness was in Christ being not only the judging God, but the judged man, as, as I stated. And the, here's the power, the tension. The entire life of Christ was one act of redeeming love. The moment God entered into the human story, Jesus took on human form, which means he took on sinful flesh, but did not sin. And his entire life was a life of active obedience in which he bent back the will of man toward righteousness to the Father, and then in passive obedience became the, the sin bearer, the one who carried the weight of sin upon himself. And in those two incredible acts, both his active obedience as the, as the obedient son and the, and the passive obedience as the sin bearer carrying the judgment of mankind upon himself, he enables us now to enter in to a relationship with him, which is the spiritual gift given to us in the heavenly realms. That's the power of the gospel. A picture that I give you of, of grace and how different grace is from, uh, from the way that we generally love, it would be found in my, my daughter, Hattie. You know, it does say that the kingdom of heaven, uh, that we must become like little children to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm getting that more and more. My father, actually, he was here for the last service, came and heard me preach tonight. I hadn't seen my dad in 10 years, and the kids had never met him. I picked him up two weeks ago in Seattle, and uh, he, um, my dad lives in Alaska, off the grid, showed up in a trucker hat with hair down to here, and chain smoker. He's kind of scary looking. He looks like Willie Nelson, but even scarier. Um, and, uh, and, and he's, you know, he's just intimidating. My kids have never met him. My daughter's only seven years old. And before I even pick my dad up, this is Grace. My, my, my daughter says to me, I love Grandpa. I'm like, you don't even know him. I don't even know him. I'm like, how can you say that? She's like, I just love him. And Daddy, you should love him too. I'm like, I do love him. But I'm like, how do you love him? You don't know him. And she's like, he's my grandpa. I love him. I'm like, okay. I'm like, 
So I was just thinking cheap words. We'll see what she does when she sees them. Um, and uh, so then I pick him up, and my father is like really, he was nervous to go to my house. In fact, he tried to get out of it a couple times. He's like, he's like, I think I'm too tired to see the kids tonight. And I think he was worried about being rejected by them. And, you know, he's a, he's a rough, rough man. Amazing. I love him. I've been having a, a great time spending with him. Uh, but we pull up to the house, and Hattie has literally been standing on the side of the street waiting for him for half an hour. And we pull up, and my dad's exhausted, and he had two strokes last year, so he, he's only 62, and so he's not walking really well. And I get out, of, get out of the car, and I help him get out of the car, and he's really stressed, and he's a chain smoker. I'm mean, talking like, he made me stop like every 15 minutes from Seattle to Portland so he could smoke. It was incredible. Um, so, so he's a stress. He's needing a cigarette. And my daughter, without judgment, total pure grace, just walks up to my father and wraps her arms around him just wraps her arms around him and just tells, her, tells him that she loves him. He didn't do anything to earn her love, nothing. She doesn't know him from Adam, and yet she is already compelled out of the heart of who she is as a human being to make him feel loved. And then she sat there with him, and Hattie really dislikes cigarettes, really dislikes cigarettes. And my dad lights a cigarette, and she, she, she acts like cigarettes are just like, like the house is on fire or something, like it's the worst thing ever. And so she... But she goes close to, close to Grandpa, and she like looks down, and, she, and she's, just, she's watching him smoke. But she goes, I really like your boots. <laughs> <laughs> and then to top it off, I said, told the kids, I'm like, I got to get my dad to Aunt Penny's house and, uh, and so he can get some sleep. And I was talking to Darcy, and my dad was like really hurting at this point. He has a hard time walking down the stairs. And Hattie, I look up, and there's Hattie. With, I see Hattie's back and my dad's back. And she goes, Grandpa, let me help you. And she walks him to the car. She becomes his burden bearer. That is grace. That's what grace is like. It's that pure. Maybe the heart of the father is more like a child than you even can begin to imagine. Without judgment. Because he took the judgment into himself as a once and for all act. You see, Jesus on the cross as the judging God and the judged man, he condemned sin in the flesh as a final act of judgment. That's why Jesus was so tormented. That's why he was called the son of sorrows. And he did that, that he might lavish on us grace, unmerited favor, favor that we do not deserve. That's the gospel. That's the gospel, and that's why it's a gift. Look at verses eight through 10. Not only is the gift election, God's decision about us in Christ, nor is it simply grace, God's love toward us in Christ, but it's also knowledge, God's purpose for us in Christ by the power of the Spirit. Look at verses 8 through 10. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. You know, this is a powerful thing because one of the things that's consistently declared in the New Testament is that the will of God is to be revealed to us. And the will of God is something that I get asked about constantly. What is God's will for my life? I can't even tell you how many times I've been asked that question. I want, I want to know what God's will is for me. Should I, I, don't, I can't tell what God's will is if I should take this job or if I should marry this guy or this girl. The will of God, if I was to put it in the most simple terms, is something that is actually no longer a mystery. It is a mystery that has been revealed. The will of God is what God has done in Christ. And uh, even better put, there is no will of God apart from Christ. He's the final word. He's the revelation of God's heart toward you. See how it all comes back to Jesus? It's not a Jesus only because we believe in the triune God, but it's, it's Jesus central because Jesus is the human face on the unseen God. And so the Spirit is pointing us to Jesus and the Father is giving us Jesus. And the bottom line is this, the will of God is wrapped up in the incarnation because what Jesus reveals to us is God's willingness to identify himself with you. Absolutely for now and forever. And so the knowledge that we grow in is this knowledge that 
God has brought forth the final word, the final victory in Christ. And what is the purpose of this? It is to, look at this, I love this, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Notice that even, you could go on and on in these passages, but you have a past reality, God's election. You have a present reality, what God has given us in Christ now. And you have a future reality, what God is accomplishing through that work of Christ on the cross. His life, his death, his resurrection and ascension, which is the total victory, which is bringing all things under the rule of Christ, which is exactly what Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 11 says, that there will be a day when every tongue will confess Jesus as Lord and every knee will be bowed to him. And once again, that's not speaking of universal salvation, but what it is speaking of is a universal rule of Christ. And we are working toward that fulfillment. That's our hope, is in that fulfillment. But it's a fulfillment that's already based in something that's been done on the cross. The victory is now patiently playing itself out as God gives room for people to respond to the decision that he has made about them in Jesus. I always, people ask, why is God taking so long? Because, because God has time. He's patient. It's a good thing. It's a good news. And the goal of all of this, the goal of history, is to bring all things under the rule of Jesus, which brings me to the final thing. The final aspect of God's gift is his redemption, God's possession of us. Look at verses 12 through 14. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who are the first to put our hope in Christ, that's the Jews, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included, that's the Gentiles, in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, which is the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, the gospel of your salvation. What they heard about was the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus. When you believed, the Holy Spirit opened their eyes. They responded. You were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And here we have redemption, God's possession of his, of us. Redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Our inheritance, his possession. Gary Brashear has told me that the supreme, uh, the supreme theme of this passage is God providing a bride for his son. I think that that is an accurate picture. I think the supreme theme is God's blessing upon us through his son, but I think that both statements are true because as a bride, we receive the blessing of Christ as our true husband, spiritual husband. Uh, most men aren't comfortable calling Jesus their husband, but he is the husband of the church. Be comfortable with that. And I think that this is the thing that, that, that we have here is that he has chosen us and predestined us according to the plan that he had in Jesus, for Jesus is the elect. And what has he brought us into? He has brought us into the gospel, into a relationship with him, and he has sealed that truth with the, with the Holy Spirit, who is the, the seal upon our lives and the guarantee of a future inheritance, which is his possession, which is us. And here's the beauty of this passage is it is a picture of marriage. And the healthiest marriage is dependent upon a mutual submission. When a husband and a wife give themselves to each other, there's mutual possession. But this does not come without the surrender of one's will for the good of the other. And the same picture is given. Our possession of Christ is because of his submission for our good. God in the Son humbled himself to the point of death that we might become the righteousness of God. And here's the picture that we have is that God has given himself freely to us in Jesus, a self-humbling. And if you want to experience the fullness of God's gift in Jesus, you must put yourself under 
the lordship of Jesus. As the true husband of the church, if we as a church community want to engage in this spiritual battle, which is, which is raging for souls all around us, and it is very real, we must put ourselves under the headship of Jesus. The book of Ephesians, the letter of Ephesians is supremely about the role of the church and its identification in Christ. And our blessing as a church is identified in our willingness to walk by the Spirit and to put ourselves under, the, under surrender, under submission to Jesus' lordship of our lives. And the problem is, is that we want the inheritance without submitting our will. But God wants to do so much more in and through this church. I know it. I think Northeast Portland in the, in the coming months is gonna be a new season of insanity, but with that is gonna come all sorts of new spiritual attack. And the question is, are you guys ready? Are you submitted to Christ and submitted to one another in such a way that we will truly function as one body as the bride of Christ, um, who he is our possession and we are his. We are his inheritance and he is ours. And so I just would say this, that as his inheritance, it requires consecration on our part, but it also brings about an assurance and, and of, of safety in Christ because people always ask me, how do I know that I'm saved? Well, assurance comes through obedience. I never have met a, a sure Christian who walks in utter and total disobedience. They're always unsure of their salvation because the evidence of our election is that we have been set apart to be holy and blameless, it says. And so you belong to Jesus and he belongs to you. There is a part of him that is with you here on earth but there is a part of you that is with him in the heavenly realms. And he has called us as a church to receive the full gift of his presence, his an intimate presence amongst us that we might be prepared to engage in the battle for souls. Amen.